Okay, good afternoon. Welcome to the Sierra Club uh, Pennsylvania Chapters Conservation Fall Webinar Series. Uh, this series is titled Electric Vehicle Myths and is hosted by the Pennsylvania Chapters Clean Transportation Conservation Team. My name is Jim Wiley and uh, my volunteer role with the Sierra Club is as Pennsylvania Chapter and the Pennsylvania Chapter is as Conservation Vice Chair. Um, before I introduce uh, our speakers today, um, on today's topic, I'll do a little housekeeping. I've muted everyone. Please keep your microphone muted until you are invited to come off mute. Uh, uh, you're invited to introduce yourself uh, with your name and county or town in the chat. Um, uh, anything else you want to share with us? Uh, you can enter questions in the chat as we go along, but we have uh, 10 prepared questions for our panelists today. Um, so you might, might want to wait and see what uh, questions we already have queued up. Um, yeah, unless there's a, a, a clarifying question, uh, feel free to raise your hand and, and interrupt, like, you know, what does this acronym stand for? Um, so thank you for these uh, considerations. This session will be recorded and will be posted on the uh, chapter YouTube page. Um, so today we have uh, uh, moderators, myself and Howard Sherman, who is uh, the Delco Green Team co-leader, and panelists Dennis Rohan, uh, Rob Altenberg, and Fred Crable. I'm going to ask them to introduce themselves a little further in just a moment. Um, so just a little context. So this is the fall webinar series. Um, this is the last of the of the seven webinars we've held this uh, this fall. Um, it's been fun, and uh, you can find or it says descriptions and registrations. But now you can find the recordings to all these seven uh, sessions at at the uh, link on the bottom there. So with that, uh, we're going to get into our um, uh, electric vehicle miss webinar. Oh, I just uh, yeah. So let me do that and. Um, introduce uh, Dennis. Dennis, you want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Sure. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for this uh, series, the invite. Thanks for everybody uh, taking time out of your day today to learn about the EV truths and dispel the myths. Dennis Rowan from Lansdowne Borough. I've been driving EV since 2012. Uh, done over about 130,000 miles uh, EV. Uh, professionally, uh, my company REVIG, which stands for Renewable Energy Integrated Vehicle to Grid, helps fleets, uh, public fleets, private fleets, municipal fleets, uh, convert their fleets uh, with economic suitability and use suitability to EV, making that transition as smooth as possible. Thanks, Jim. Okay, hey, thanks, uh, Fred. Hi, everybody. Um... Uh, so my name is Fred Crable from Pittsburgh, and I've done a lot with EVs over the years. I work with the Solar Fest uh, here in Pittsburgh, a number of different, uh, we had a, like seven different years that we had it here, and we always had a large EV show with it. And uh, I had a 2012 Chevy Volt, and then uh, in 2018, I had a, a Tesla Model 3. I sold my Chevy Volt, and interestingly, I ran into the guy who bought it yesterday, and he still gets like 12 miles of range from that like uh over 12 about 12 year old chevy volts so anyway i'm really into evs i read a lot about them thanks and uh, finally rob hey I'm rob altenberg i'm a senior director for energy and climate and future and um this is my third and uh, 33 years doing uh environmental policy work started out doing motor vehicle modeling with department of environmental protection uh, many many years ago uh Following EVs closely, I mean, I recall being at the uh, 1996 Tour de Sol, where a car that got 375 miles on a single charge was shocking news uh, um, uh, around, you know, re really around the world. So uh, it's been interesting to see how EVs have been progressing since then. All right, thanks. So the way this is going to work is a little bit different than the other webinars we've done. We're going to have kind of a uh, Howard and I are going to be moderators, and we're going to ask, uh, we've prepared 10 questions for our panelists, our panel of experts here. Um, 
And uh, uh, I think uh, um, if a uh, panelist has a supporting slide he'd like to share, uh, I, I'm ready to, uh, to share that on the screen just to il illustrate a point. Um, so with that, Howard, you want to say a little bit about uh, where you're coming from? And uh, you can actually, before you do that, I wanted, I had uh, kind of a preview of Right, so these are kind of the areas that we're going to be, uh, we're going to touch on as far as electric vehicle myths around cost, safety, carbon footprint, environmental impact of, of lithium, uh, tax credits, uh, charging range, uh, finding a charger on road trips, uh, the, uh, tech is buggy, uh, large vehicles are, are suitable for electrification, and then time to charge. So, Okay, now Howard, um, yeah, please say a bit about where you're coming from and uh, you can ask the first question. Okay, hello everybody, I'm Howard Sherman. I'm co-chair of the Delaware County, Chair Club Delaware County uh, Green Team and I'm also a volunteer with Lansdowne EAC. Uh, also, I just bought my first EV last week so I'm on board. Um, so let's get to the first question. This is for Fred to start, and then Dennis has a case study. Question, only rich people can afford an EV. Are EVs and home chargers cost-effective right now in Pennsylvania? Okay, thanks for the question, Howard. <laughs> I think just up front, we can see that there's a tremendous momentum heading towards cheaper and cheaper electric vehicles. And we already see that in China, where 50% of the new cars sold right now are electric, have a plug in them. And BYD has already reached price parity with a gas car. They are selling cars for cheaper than the price of a gas car. A BYDC goal I hear is like ten dollars to $15,000 or something like that. You can Google and learn more about that. Uh, in the show notes, there's going to be a link about the 11 cheapest electric cars in the U.S., uh, that which Jim is going to send around afterwards. And going from that list, I picked out the Chevy Equinox. Jim, if you want to bring up that slide on the Equinox, if you have it available, no. Uh, so I just I just picked out a price from a dealership. And if you look at after the incentives, the Chevy Equinox is now down around 34 or 34. Thirty-four or thirty-three thousand dollars, and that's not the cheapest of the cars on this list. But I just should say that some of the cars on this list have a lesser range. But uh, my my point is that it, these electric cars are not just for rich anymore; they're becoming more and more affordable. And uh, so we keep seeing increases in range in electric cars. Rivian now has a four hundred mile range. Uh, Lucid has a five hundred mile range. And a Chinese bat, the biggest Chinese battery company in the world, CATL, is has they are, they are saying they have a 600 mile range battery, and that would just be revolutionary. Um, another link I have you'll get in the show notes are uh, from uh, an article about this battery that CATL is out with now. Uh, as I said, China already has cars cheaper than gas uh, gas cars that they're selling electric vehicles. And uh, so what's happening now is the European market and the U.S. market do not want to have their car industries decimated by cheaper electric cars. So they're doing tariffs, but that's going to be a challenge and they won't be able to hold back forever on that, you know, um, because Europe's in, a, in an awkward position where they have their manufacturers that are active in China selling cars, too. So. Uh, there's, uh, I feel that what we're going to see in the next couple of years is uh, is a huge pressure to bring um, less expensive electric vehicles to market to fill out the market. Uh, Tesla has been working on a twenty five thousand dollar electric vehicle, but uh, they've recently got sidetracked with their robo taxi. But there are other U.S. car companies working on those cheaper electric vehicles. Uh, economies of scale, cheaper battery prices will all help to add to this. And I think the the car manufacturers are going to feel pressure to bring these cheaper cars because somebody's going to do it, and they're going to have to, you know, have an answer to that too. So, uh, the other thing that I was going to talk about a little bit is home chargers. Um, 
I put an article. Oh, there is another article in the show notes about BYD, which is um, soon to be the largest electric car manufacturer. They're a Chinese car company. They're they're already bigger than Tesla when you include uh, plug-in hybrid electric vehicles, and uh, they've already produced their 10 millionth car cumulatively. Um, so electric cars are, are really growing quite significantly. And later on, in the, I'll tell you what worldwide EV sales are, so you get a, a uh, get an idea of what that is. So the last part of my question was about the EV chargers, and I just wanted to point out that um, you know, installing EV chargers at home, there's a tax credit with the Inflation Reduction Act to help uh, lower the price on that. Uh, you may, if you've looked into the price of them, they are a little bit expensive, but there are cheaper alternatives where you could get basically a, an electric oven or a dryer outlet instead of the uh, electric car branded uh, charging uh, system. And I had one of those installed for myself, and that was only $600. That's a NEMA 1450 that... Uh, uh, just a standard electric oven outlet that Jim just put up on the screen there. And then I think there was one other slide after this one, Jim. I forget what it was. Oh, yeah. This is the article that's going to be linked to in the notes you'll get about this 600-mile range battery that CATL says they already have uh, going into production, which it just blows my mind. We're going to have a 600-mile range electric car is really something, I think. Over to you, Jim. Right, thanks, Dennis. Did you want to uh, add to that? You're on mute, Dennis. Thanks, Tim. Uh, yeah, I could build off what Fred did and go through a quick case study of uh, comparing the uh, EV to a comparable gas vehicle. You want me to do that now? Yeah, sure. OK. So I, as I said, I've been driving EV for 12 years. I just got my third EV. Every electric vehicle I've had has been less than the comparable gas car. I had a Volt for two years, which had lower cost than the Chevy Cruze. I had a uh, Chevy Spark Electric for the last eight years. I still have it as my second car. That was less than the gas uh, Spark, and now I just uh, acquired a used 22 Kia Nero EV, and I'll go through the process of how I selected this. The Nero, I was looking at the Nero, the Ionic, and a Bolt. Um, before I went EV, I never leased a car. Uh, I leased my first Volt. The reason I leased, EVs are still progressing much faster. There are some great leases out there, which are the same, if not lower than get leasing a, a gas car. Uh, and also, so after two years, if the technology is really improved, you do not have to buy that, or you could buy it with uh, after the two year period. So if you go to the next slide, Jim, I'll show you um, what I looked at was comparing these, the total cost of operation. So here's the uh, projected, you can all go to this site. This is true cost to own. It's an Edmund site. If you just Google true cost to own, you can put in any EV in the comparable gas car and compare them just like I did. When we do this for professional fleets, municipal fleets, college fleets, uh, corporate fleets, we use a few more metrics. The first thing is how do you use your car? Do you do 10,000 miles a year? The average American goes 12, they do 28 miles a day. So I do about 10,000 miles a year. Uh, so I don't need a 500 mile range. I don't need a 400 mile range. I, so the Kia uh, projector range is 250. Uh, that'll let me do a 500 mile trip, you know, with one or two charges, which is perfect for me. That's the first thing you look at is range suitability. And then cost suitability, this true cost to own that you see 33,000, that takes in all the metrics you see there, depreciation, tax fees, financing, fuel, et cetera, et cetera. Next slide, Jim. So that's the gas. And then I compared it to the EV. And you can see after the rebates, it's 28,500. So it's 5,000, yes, less. And this is pretty accurate. It's the true cost to own. Uh, this metric is for 15,000 miles a year. So I extrapolated my cost would be about 30% less because I'm only doing about 10,000 miles. But any of you can go to true cost to own, do this, and you'll find that a lot of EVs, if you're gonna operate them, they cost less. 
if all you want to do is keep it in your driveway, the cost may be less for a gas car, but if you're going to use it to actually do mobility, the EVs over five years, 10 years, they're going to cost you less because of the different metrics you see, fuel being a big one, repairs, et cetera, et cetera. So the next slide shows you that the summary of this, if you go on, Jim. So over five years, 65,000 miles, the true cost to own the Kia EV, it'll save about $5,000 and reduce around 45 tons of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, those of you who are with municipalities, a big thing here is the myth. Oh, sustainability costs too much. EVs cost too much. Well, actually, no. Every, uh, you know, you can see here, you're actually reducing cost and emissions at the same time. That's a big myth to dispel. Driving EV can be economically affordable, energy affordable, and emissions more affordable. That's it, Jim. Right. All right, thanks, Dennis. Thanks a lot. Um, next, but back to you, Dennis. Uh, the next question is uh, lithium. The myth is lithium batteries catch fire. Um, are, are electric vehicles safe? They are much, much safer just from a fire perspective. So the metric from the National Highway uh, Safety Administration is gas cars catch on fire 25 times more, 25x. All right, 25 times four. That's measuring, there's about 3 million EVs on the road. Uh, these are actual fires reported. Gas vehicles, as you know, are already on fire. They're combusting, right? So when they get in an accident, sometimes that fire you know, goes out. So uh, in Norway and in Europe, the metrics are even higher. Uh, it's 100 times more for the gas cars. I don't know if that's because Americans are crazier drivers or what, but uh, significantly less. I mean, major, major less. One interesting thing is the highest rate of fires is hybrids, because you have two systems that can fail, right? You're already combusting and you've got a battery there. So uh, hybrids catch on fire even more than gas vehicles, because they're both already on fire, they get an accident, you know, that fire will, will spread. That's a major, major myth. Uh, but, you know, if every time there were a gas fire, which is 50,000 times a year in the U.S., it was on the front page, like, you know, an EV fire, you would think, oh, you know, we would we would get a measure. But EVs are in the news because they're new. Um, but that is a major, major myth. What is true, though, lithium fires are different. Uh, EV fires are different. But now every fire department in the country is trained you do have to treat them uh, differently. But EVs overall are much, much safer. Uh, the insurance rates should reflect this. Uh, there needs to be a major PUC hearing because some insurance companies are now charging more for EVs because of this very myth. But if you look at the actual statistics, which is what insurance is supposed to be based on, EVs catch fire 25 to 100 times less than gas vehicles, which are perpetually on fire. And then when they get in an accident, there are more fatalities uh, from fires with gas vehicles and uh, more uh, injuries, more hospital stays uh, with that same metric, about 20 to 25 times more for gasoline vehicles, given the same number, given a million EVs and a million uh, gas vehicles, it's 25 times more according to the National Highway Administration. Back to you, Jim. Yeah, go ahead, Howard. Okay, uh, question number three. This one is for Rob Aldenberg. Miss, EVs have a similar carbon footprint as a gas car because EVs are charged from power stations powered by fossil fuels. Is that true? Yeah, well, uh, being a myth, uh, no, uh, not true. And this really is very similar to what Dennis brought up. I think a lot of people, uh, they're so used to being around gasoline and fossil fuels that they just don't think of the dangers associated with it. Certainly the dangers of fire that Dennis mentioned, but also the pollution, the chemicals, whether it's bottled organics, uh, air toxics, and other things that are related 
to fuel it. EVs are cleaner than gas cars in almost every situation, even if they're plugged into our existing power grid, and even if you include all of the emissions in the manufacturing process. The Department of Energy looked at this um, uh, just in a recent, fairly recent study, and they said with today's generation mix on the Pennsylvania grid, so what you know what we have on our what we have on our outlets today, um, uh, gasoline vehicles produce about six times as much pollution to run as what the average EV produces. So where an EV might have slightly higher um, emissions in the manufacturing process, it doesn't take long for those operational emissions from the gasoline vehicles to quickly outstrip uh, what you're seeing from EVs. But there's also another way to look at it. So being cleaner when you plug it in today is good. But also the question is, is the technology uh, that we're adopting going to get us on a pathway where we need to go? So if we're going to address the most serious impacts of climate change, we really need to be able to cut our vehicle emissions by at least 80%, uh, if not more, over the next 25 years. And fossil fuels, yeah, you get minor efficiency improvements and CAFE standards may change a little bit year to year, but that doesn't create a pathway to get those sorts of deep emission reductions. When you look at the technologies that do get us on that pathway, Battery electric vehicles are certainly one of them. Hydrogen fuel cells, you know, maybe another one. But of those two, uh, EVs are far less expensive to buy. Uh, the challenges with infrastructure that you'd need around alternatives uh, um, uh, would be even more expensive. So right now, getting on the pathway to increase the uh, fielding of the battery electric vehicles is really the right direction. Okay, thanks, Rob. Um, so question number four, or myth number four, is that lithium mine, mining has uh, a lot of environmental concerns. And batteries, uh, lithium batteries are, are going to our landfills at the end of the life of the electric vehicle. Um, so Fred, can you, uh, can you speak to that myth? Yes. Um, so uh, let me just give you a little bit of background about lithium. There's uh, So the key is how are we obtaining the lithium? How are we abstracting it, processing it? And there's two ways right now. They get it from a salty brine and then they uh, an underground source and then it's brought to the surface of the earth and then it's uh, evaporated in pools and uh, leaving behind the lithium. The lithium is treated with chemicals and filtered to separate out the lithium. Uh, hard rock where they crush uh, hard uh, rock into and and then process the lithium to purify it. And uh, so lithium extraction is a water intensive process that uses a combination of fresh water and toxic chemicals. The arid nature of some mining sites can lead to water shortages and droughts. Hard rock extraction can also leave behind mine tailings that negatively impact local water supplies. However, the important thing to remember is you're getting lithium to produce a battery that right now in most cars, you get an eight year to 10 year warranty on, and it go, it's a warranty for 100,000 to 150,000 miles, and it gets thousands and thousands of cycles of use. And at the end of life, we now have battery recycling. J.B. Straubel, who was a former executive at Tesla, started a company called Redwood Materials, says that 95% of these batteries, the battery can be recycled at the end of life. So we're not going to be mining for all of our lithium. So the point is, with fossil fuels, this, you're mining and drilling for that, too, with similar processes, similar issues, but you're only using it once. So you're, the, the point is there's far less mining and extracting for lithium needed to be done to create the clean energy EV battery future, far less mining gonna be needed and pollution than what we have with oil and fossil fuels. Uh, I didn't get a lot into the science. This is sort of a complicated question, okay? You know, comparing, well, how dirty is lithium compared to oil, fossil fuels? I mean, it's all dirty, really. And it's something if you want to look into it more, you can. But, uh, you know, they're both polluting uh, processes. Uh, let's see. So really, I think that's all I had to say about it. it there's going to be a lot less mining and extracting and pollution from the lithium batteries.
Thanks, Fred. So in other words, there's no such thing as guilt-free uh, transportation, um, right. but it's by, by degree, uh, per mile traveled, it should be much less than an electric vehicle. Dennis or, or Rob, did you have anything you wanted to add to that? Um, I would just echo what Fred said. You know, Straubel's company, Redwood, has raised about a billion and a half dollars. That recycling uh, business is getting bigger and bigger. You know, now that we have three and a half million EVs in the U.S., as Fred said, uh, they can be recycled or they can be repurposed on the grid uh, as stationary community storage. So they're very, very valuable and you know, they're not being put to waste. They're not being put in landfills. So just echoing what Fred said there. I'll, I'll also add, we, we also hear a similar myth saying, well, to get the number of EVs where you want it to be, it would take more lithium than is, you know, and some, you know, make projections in large numbers like that. And, uh, you know, even assuming those projections are accurate, I mean, lithium, we use lithium today because it is, you know, the most cost-effective convenient technology we have. There are constantly new technologies being uh, investigated, and the, we shouldn't worry about, well, maybe we'll run out of lithium in 20 years. We don't know that it's going to be the, the technology of choice in 20 years. Um, you know, it's, you know, it's, it's certainly a better choice for the environment now. Yeah, there's also, um, you can, if you read articles about battery upcoming technologies, there's a sodium ion battery, apparently, that's very hardy for low temperatures down below freezing. It's much harder than a lithium battery. So to Rob's point, uh, the, the technology and improvements on batteries is still, to this day, uh, we keep seeing more and more stuff entering the market and improvements to the batteries. So we could well, um, I mean, for quite a while, there was the worry about cobalt and nickel on batteries, and then they moved to this lithium iron phosphate battery that has no cobalt or nickel uh two kind of rare substances so that problem was kind of alleviated uh and we may see further alleviations of some of the problems with, or issues with lithium by going to another uh like a sodium ion battery all right now well all right uh question number five item number five State and federal subsidies could evaporate with the next administration. This one's for Rob. Uh, yeah, oh, what a question. Yeah, I, uh, uh, in evenings or next semester, I'm teaching environmental law at Widener uh, Commonwealth Law School. And uh, I was commenting to somebody that my syllabus is becoming a choose your own adventure novel because we just don't know so much of what's going to happen with the various. Um, uh, regulatory and legislative initiatives. Um, the short answer is, um, yes, things can definitely change in the next administration. Uh, they will likely take some time. So the Inflation Reduction Act is what provides that uh, $7,500 tax incentive for new EVs and a lower incentive for uh, qualified used EVs through 2032. That could change. That would require legislation to change it. So that would be so that would uh, presumably be time consuming. And we'd have to see if that sort of thing could get through uh, the legislature. Uh, even without legislation to change it, there is some worry that an incoming administration could uh, hamper the process, whether it's slow walking processing. Uh, 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 some of the credits on this. We don't know what that would look like. We've seen that with other things. Uh, with other programs where the administration has not been excited about and have slow walked it, uh, that may create a change. Um, but any if anything like that will likely be challenged in court. So it seems unlikely that we're going to see a very rapid change in in those. Uh, they are supporting uh, federal funding that's certainly at risk. We've seen people in Trump's orbit complained about the uh, NEVI National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure Funding uh, that's been providing money for, um, well, about $500 million of that NEVI funding has already been awarded, most of which in the last year. Uh, to the extent that money is uncommitted, that's certainly at risk. 
And also there are, uh, there's about a 15, a little more than the $15 billion package out there in incentives for electric vehicle manufacturing and associated technologies. Uh, that is certainly at risk too. Uh, on the state side, uh, well, we don't have a lot of programs uh, that I think are necessarily at risk. We just did see uh, a bill passed uh, to address some of the taxation issues on the state. It's probably unlikely that that's going to be revisited in the, in the next legislature. Um, but yeah, so a lot of changes. I mean, if you're shopping for an electric vehicle now, maybe buying it before January 21st is not, is not a bad thing to consider. Um, but I would expect it would take some time after that to change the existing tax incentives. I see Fredo has a sign up. Yeah, uh, I would just uh, also highlight a little bit that there's a group of Republicans in the House that have said that they would support the IRA because if you look at where a lot of the IRA investments are going, I think numbers are showing like two thirds of them are going to red states. And so these guys uh, want to see that investment in their state. There's stuff that's in process. For instance, Rivian electric car manufacturer is uh, very likely to get a loan to build their, their electric car factory in Georgia. And I think there's another one I read about in Indiana. Uh, I think it was a battery factory or something. So there are, there could be a, a certain group of people in the house that would not uh, allow uh, with Democrats and Republicans, a bipartisan group that would not allow a repeal of the IRA straight out. I mean, maybe they would try to repeal parts of it. I don't know. But and and what Rob said about the uh, the through the administration, there are rules in the IRA for battery components and for battery materials and uh, cars that qualify for that tax credit have to meet certain uh, amounts of battery mater materials and minerals sourced within the U.S. or um, so forth. And uh, they could try to unwind those rules and make them stricter. I think that would be something that could be done. But that that would not be an easy process. When something's completed like that, to unwind it is not that easy. But those, those are both threats that are possible, I think, for the uh, Inflation Reduction Act. Yeah, Rob, just a, a finer point. Is it reasonable to assume that uh, any new legislation that repeals this tax credit would not be retroactive? So that if, say, it's, it passes in June, but I bought my car in April, I could still claim it on my 2025 taxes. Um, it shouldn't be retroactive. I mean, without obviously without seeing what they attempt to do. <laughs> It's it's very it's very difficult to uh, uh, to make calls on that. And what Fred brought up is true. If as part of the program, maybe they say, well, this car that did qualify, we don't consider that a qualifying vehicle. Um, is that necessary? You know, if they if people buy vehicles, assuming they're qualifying under the existing program, and then the government comes and says they're not qualifying, I'm sure there's going to be litigation over that. Um, but we don't know what that outcome is going to be. The other thing to remember is that uh, as of 2024, January 1, you can take the tax credit off at the dealership and the dealership actually gives you the credit. They apply to the IRS and with 72 hours, the IRS is supposed to reimburse them $7,500. That's how it's working right now. But you still have to show on your following year taxes that you were uh, qualified for that income wise and so forth. Uh, so the beauty of that is um, you are now able to get your money up front on that. So I think it would be harder for them to unwind it if you get your money up front. Good point. All right, thanks. Moving on. Um, Dennis, uh, the myth is that EV ranges are not enough or not enough for any my particular use or yours. You, you touched on this uh, in the opening question. Can you expand on that? Sure, thanks, Jim. So for an individual or for a fleet, that's the first thing you look at is how do you use the vehicle? As I said, in my decision process, I do 10,000 miles. I do a couple trips, I'll do about 4,000 miles and factoring in the suitability for me, 250 mile range with the Kia was perfect. There are now plenty of used vehicles and new vehicles uh, beyond 250 mile range. 
And if you look at it, the way I looked at it, it's like, okay, my trip, my 700 mile trip may take me an hour longer, although I'm probably gonna use that time to charge to get food and otherwise. But over the course of a year, I'm probably saving um, you know, up to $1,500 with that EV. So for those couple hours more that on the trip I'm spending, I'm getting paid. Um, for suitability on an average day, if you have home charging or workplace charging, as I said, the average American, you know, we're, most of us are in uh, Philadelphia or maybe the Pittsburgh suburbs here, you're doing like 30 miles a day. You can top up every night. So your day-to-day -day suitability, uh, you don't need much range at all. If you're a two-car family, you could have one EV with just an 80 mile range or 100 or 150 like the, the Mini, and then have another EV like the Tesla S or the Y or the Ionic or the Bolt that gets you about a 300 mile range. Uh, with the charging stations implemented now, EVgo, Electrify America, the Tesla, uh, Nevi was mentioned a couple of times, the National Electric Vehicle Infrastructure. Every corridor, uh, 95, the Blue Route, uh, Route 30 out in Pittsburgh, the major routes, all every 50 miles, there's charging station. So route suitability is a big factor. But the good news is you probably have about 20 different models which would meet your uh, suitability requirements. And that's what we do for uh, bus fleets, say like you know school buses. The average school bus is gonna do 50 miles a day. What we look at is the dwell times. How many times, how many hours in a day is that school bus not being used? School buses are all back in the depot by six o'clock. They don't go out till six the next morning. So you have 12 hours of suitable time to charge. That helps you right size the charger. You don't need fast charging because you have a 12 hour window. I don't have a fast charger at home. I do have a level two, but most of the time I could just do level one, which is, is just a 110 volt outlet because I tell people I don't fast sleep, so I don't need to fast charge, right? Level one, I can get 40 miles a night just on a regular outlet and that's fine for 12,000 miles a year, right? When I go on a trip, I'll use the DC fast charger. So I see a lot of people overspending. They think, oh, I need fast charging at home. You know, if you're doing 150 miles a day, yeah, maybe you need that level two charger. I think, you know, level one at home, at work, uh, a lot of campuses in California, a lot of workplaces, are now putting in level one chargers. I think that's the future. The future of charging is prevalent level one everywhere and DC fast charging on trips. So those chargers go into your suitability factor. Again, the good news is you have 20, 30 models to meet your suitability requirements, but start with your usage. You know, you don't have to overspend if you know you're only doing so many miles a day. Uh, the trip chargers are there, home chargers right size it. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Howard. All right. Uh, next item. It's hard to find a charger, and there is no standard plug type or payment mechanisms. Rob, this one's for you. Yeah, and certainly any anytime you see a new technology, you're yeah. Um, we struggle with this. I'm looking at, I've got with two different charging cables on, um, uh, for different devices on my desk. And it takes a little while for industries to standardize. But, you know, when we look at the outside, when we look at, uh, you know, out the window at the roads, our outside, it's designed around cars. Uh, it's designed around gasoline cars. Uh, and the world changed to fit the gasoline car. And, you know, we're likely to see um, things change to fit uh, electric vehicles. Now, and we are, when it comes to charging standards, um, I mean, early on, uh, I think there were a, a wide variety of fairly common charging standards that we saw out there. Uh, these days on cars, most of the cars uh, that are sold in the US today are probably meeting the, uh, probably have the CCS chargers and uh, probably most of the charging stations are, are that type of charger. We're seeing a shift now in uh, 2022, uh, Tesla opened up their standards uh, to manufacturers, and now we're seeing um, um, really all of the major automakers in the U.S. in the process of adopting that Tesla standard, Tesla standard for the charger. 
uh, certainly seems the way the shift is going. We've also seen uh, companies now marketing adapters. So between Tesla and CCS back and forth, uh, you can adapt uh, charging standards. Um, you know, that is, you know, certainly if you buy maybe an older used vehicle, you might uh, you might have an odd uh, charging uh, charger that uh, um, you would have to be sure you could either adapt or find or or that that fit your use case, uh, but shouldn't be a significant issue for any uh, 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 for any like reasonably uh, new electric vehicle. Um, the um, payment systems. I mean, that really becomes when the hard part, the hardware, uh, adapting one hardware uh, system to the other isn't the hard part. Uh, the hard part is where companies have to uh, get their software talking to each other because a gas pump doesn't care what sort of vehicle you put the nozzle into. You know, you, you, know, you, just put, you put the gas pump in, press the lever, gas flows. It doesn't care. In an electric vehicle, there's a sort of negotiation that has to go back and forth between the car and the charger uh, to determine that it can take the charging rate and, all, uh, 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 and a number of other issues. And the payment certainly uh, has, to, has, uh, has to be addressed with that. Um, there, there are issues, <laughs> um, but there's certainly issues that we're seeing, um, that we're seeing resolved. I mean, one of the uh, one of the ones I just heard somebody mention earlier is with cars adapting to the Tesla standard. Well, Tesla chargers tend to have very short charging cables because all Teslas have their charging port in the same place. Uh, so what people are finding now as well, they they might be able to use a Tesla charging port, <laughs> but you know Tesla has to now make longer cables because they can't necessarily get the charger to where the port is on their car. There's issues like that we're seeing. Um, those are likely to be worked out and be worked out fairly rapidly. Okay, thanks. We're, we're doing pretty good on time, but but uh, let's keep moving. We've got three left. Um, so uh, for Fred, this is a new technology and there are lots of bugs requiring recalls. Can you speak to that, Fred? Yeah. Um... I think one of the worst uh, recalls that I heard over the last number of years was a Chevy Bolt. Uh, they had a danger of spontaneously catching on fire. The uh, manufacturer was telling you not to park it in a garage. And they what they did was they replaced every battery pack for those. And since that happened, uh, I really haven't heard a lot of issues on the Chevy Bolt. Um, but another thing to remember about this technology is uh, there's – way few moving parts, less moving parts in an electric vehicle than a gas car. And that goes to the point already brought up that there's less maintenance needed on these cars. There's no oil changes needed on them. So you probably will see less issues from mechanical uh, recall issues because there's less moving parts. And uh, But the other thing that they do have, full disclosure here, I'll tell you some of the disadvantages is they have a lot of software to run these cars and Oftentimes the software needs updated. In the case of Tesla, they can update the software over the air. And some of the other manufacturers, uh, I think sometimes you have to bring it in to get the software updated. So that is another issue. Um, and maybe uh, for full disclosure, I'll say, uh, uh, just another point I'd like to bring up about electric cars is that, uh, you know, the brakes last a lot longer because you have regenerative coasting or braking with the motor slowing you down, not the, the brakes. But they do, the tires do wear uh, a lot faster on electric car. They're heavier vehicles or they wear faster. I shouldn't call it a lot faster. They do wear faster because of the heavier vehicle and people oftentimes use the jackrabbit starts and that uh, is harder on tires. So, um but I think in general, uh, I haven't heard of any really, really serious bad recalls. They've had recalls on electric cars, but uh, for the most part, uh, you know, a lot of times the software needs uh, updated, but that's getting better all the time. So um, just so people understand, um, it's really not so much a new technology anymore. I just want to give you a little brief uh, understanding of where we are with worldwide sales of electric vehicles. In 2018, 2.1 million electric vehicles sold around the world. 2019, it was 2.3. In 2020, it went up to 3.2. 
In 2021, from 3.2, it went to 6.6 .6 million sold worldwide. And in 20, then the next year, that was 2022, it went to 10.2 million. And then in 2023, 14 million EVs sold worldwide. It's looking like we may see about 17 million worldwide this year. And I should point out that China is the leader, the worldwide leader in electric vehicles, but Europe and and the U.S. is actually kind of a bit of a laggard, except for California. Third quarter of this year, 26.4 electric vehicle. Uh, excuse me, third quarter of this year, 26.4 of the new vehicles sold in California were electric, 20, that 26.4% of the market. So it's really heading to mainstream. I think it's really going to overtake the gas car, is my opinion. Uh, it seems like an unstoppable process. You know, there are things that stand in the way, you know, tariffs, et cetera. But looking at, you know, what we're seeing in the numbers, I think it's going to continue to grow. Jim? You're on mute, Howard. Uh, the next item is for any of the three of you. Battery electric tech doesn't work for larger vehicles. You should tell that to the railroad companies. They have diesel electric, and they 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 use diesel to generate the electricity. But the electricity runs runs the, uh, and that's been for many many years. So that's a pretty big vehicle, I would say. <laughs> and, and you you see that with you know with also uh, trucks trucks and other vehicles where. Um, certainly, when you talk about the battery pack, as Fred mentioned, the vehicles tend to be heavier um, than an electric vehicle tends to be heavier than an equivalent gas vehicle. But when you when you go to larger vehicles, the uh, battery pack weight is a lower percentage of the overall vehicle weight. Um, so when you've already got a vehicle that's designed that's designed heavier, you've got you have some advantages there. Yep, yeah, and. Generally, electric vehicles are five to eight times more energy efficient, and that holds for garbage trucks, for buses, for semis. So we've done analysis for municipalities for uh, garbage vehicles, which get about two miles to the gallon, the, the ones that are existing, the diesels. Your electric equivalent would be up around 14. So that's seven times less energy, which is seven times less money per year. And that's a, a huge savings. So that energy efficiency holds true, which translates into economic efficiency, even on the bigger vehicles. Yeah, a year or two, Tesla did a um, thing for the public uh, talking about how um, fossil fuels are so inefficient compared to electric motors. And one thing that might help you understand that is there's so much wasted heat in the combustion of using gasoline in your car. And the culprit is your radiator. That radiator is working real hard to take the heat out of the engine or the engine would literally melt from the combustion and the wasted heat that's in a car. And you don't have that in an electric vehicle. There's not, there's not combustion. There's not a lot of excess heat. And so consequently, electric motors are very much more uh, efficient. Well, there is some... Uh, um intelligence in, in at least my car to keep the batteries cool, right? When on a hot day, I can hear the fans coming on, right? It's not anywhere near the heat in a gas motor though, but yeah, that's true. I mean, it's not, it's, the, it's much more heat in a gas motor than, than what you're gonna see in a battery. Um, the, uh, the, the development of electric buses and electric garbage trucks uh, was mentioned. Uh, can any of you talk about some of the other types of heavy vehicles which have been electrified? There's uh, Fortescue, which is a company in Australia that does a lot of mining. They have very, very heavy dump trucks. I mean, huge, massive dump trucks that they're electrifying heavy equipment for, uh, you know, digging and so forth is being electrified, you know, and so forth. And Howard, two of the largest uh, companies, Cummins and Caterpillar, are both going heavily in, into EVs for farm equipment and large 
you know, uh, movers, earth movers, everything like that. So Caterpillar and Cummins are multi-billion dollar companies who are, are going to be around and they recognize that EVs are the future for a lot of the larger equipment. You also see uh, EVs and like airport service equipment um, and things like that, pushback tractors and things like that. Very effective for those. Can any of you talk about the electric school bus programs? I mean, not the, the financing of it, but just the fact whether they, they work in a school bus application? Um, I could start it off. Yeah, they definitely work. I mean, the uh, rebate under the current uh, administration under the bipartisan infrastructure law, the Inflation Reduction Act is fantastic. Um, EPACT around here, uh, the Energy Policy Act. I don't know if Tony Bandiero is on the call. He's been asked, act, uh, helping a lot of the local school districts. The, again, the suitability analysis has to be done up front. There have been a couple municipalities, uh, school districts who have skipped that suitability analysis and they end up paying too much money. You can really right size the buses and select the routes. If you have uh, 50 different routes, there are probably at least 10, 20% of those routes where it's not just going to be environmentally beneficial, but economically. So if you do the analysis up front, you can both, the school districts are showing and the evidence is there, they're saving money and saving emissions, especially with the, the rebates right now. Um, I hear a lot about and have seen a lot of the uh, delivery trucks, the last mile delivery trucks, are those being electrified? Yes, uh, Rivian, uh, so Rivian uh, is making an electric delivery truck for Amazon. Amazon has invested in Rivian and they've ordered 100,000 electric delivery vans, last mile delivery vans from Rivian. And Rivian is probably about 15,000, maybe getting close to 20,000 into completing that order. They have not completed that order for 100,000 delivery vans. But I was at my sister's in New Jersey a year or so ago, and I saw one of the delivery vans pull up. They have a very distinct look in the back. It's sort of like a three parts of a rectangle lighting system. You can kind of pick them out pretty easily. Uh, and their GM has a vehicle called Bright Drop, which is a box truck. Uh, there's uh, and Ford has uh, smaller delivery vans, which is a tr e, e Transit. They call it. There's like three trims of that, I think. And uh, the, the post office is actually getting some of those. And there's this contractor that's made uh, delivery vans for the post office called Oshkosh, I believe is the name. For years, they had a very inefficient gasoline uh, delivery van that got eight miles to a gallon. And they're, they're, you know, those things are like, they're still on the road and they're like 30 years old or something like that. Well, the, the, the post office is starting to switch over to an Oshkosh electric vehicle. And they're also getting some, e-transit Ford delivery vans. And uh, there is another one out there that escapes me, but I can't think of the name of it. And I'd say last mile was actually the, the first successful use of EVs. In the 1930s in England, my mother's milk was delivered with an electric milk float. Um, so they, um, you know, they've, they, you know, it's, you know, when you have an opportunity to centrally fuel a vehicle, um, you don't have any of the infrastructure issues. If it meets the range capacity, it fits, you know, it can fit very well. Um, so, you know, certainly there are lots of delivery applications. And I just saw I was behind two of the uh, Rivian Amazons just yesterday. They are pretty neat looking. Yeah, Robin, yep. on your point that you were talking about, so the last mile delivery vans are the ones that work best because they have, they don't need the longer range. But the question might be then, well, what are we going to do about these long range semis that need like 500 miles? Well, that kind of has already been answered. Tesla has come out with a semi uh, electric truck. They've only done, uh, you know, uh, they have a they have a low volume assembly line for them right now. And PepsiCo already has about 100 of those semi trucks, 500 mile range. And we're hearing good reports on them that they're working well, hitting their range targets. And actually, right now in Nevada, very near Tesla's battery factory, they're building a high volume production line for the Tesla semi, the 500 mile range semi. And once that thing hits high volume, the, the I, I believe if the numbers are correct that they're reporting on these electric delivery vans, 
being able to do 500 mile range between charge and you know the size of the battery and how much the fuel will cost anybody who's a sane fleet owner of any semi trucks is going to want to buy those over a diesel truck because they'll beat them tremendously on fuel prices those things run seven days a week and they use a lot of fuel and it, electricity would beat it very uh you know definitely be a lot cheaper which by the way when we get a chance jim i was just going to share a couple things about uh cost of electricity versus gasoline if we have time uh well say that let me do something first fred uh we're, we're running out of time i'm gonna skip our last question which i think dennis already touched on was the charging times um, but uh, I know there's a, uh, several people on the call today in the audience that are electric vehicle owners. Um, is there anybody that would share, would like to share a story, maybe a concerning story uh, about their EV, uh, just in, in fairness? Go ahead, Robin. Thanks. Well, I've uh, owned a Chevy Bolt since 2017, and uh, uh, some of the bugs that were mentioned have certainly once been ones I've experienced. My biggest problem is visiting kids who live in New England in the wintertime, and it's not only the temperature drop that causes the battery not to charge as fully, but you have to factor in um, the, uh, the changes in grade. So if you have a, a hilly route, um, it can get really hard to estimate how far you're going to get before you need to charge. And I certainly have been in situations where I had to turn off the heat and uh, slow way down on a, on a highway uh, in order to be able to reach the nearest uh, charging station. And my family who visited Thanksgiving, they drive an electric vehicle. They had the same thing happen to them coming down. You know, they just had to turn off the heat and it was pretty cold. So uh, it's just you have to do a lot of calculating and you have to try and it's, it's, it's there's some unknown. So it's um, I would say there's, you know, it that that's a, a feature I just live with. But I mean, it's not nothing. So I'll just mention that. Thanks. Great. Thanks. Uh, but I would say that those variabilities happen in a gas car, too. We just don't care because we can pull off the highway almost any time and fill up with gas. Right. I agree. So it's really about the range of of the car that, you know, when the ranges get to be, you know, 400, 500 miles, the same as a gas car, and there's availability of chargers, then then we won't have those issues. Do you agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. Anybody else? Choose your route. Okay. Yeah. Anybody else? All right, anybody have any questions for our panelists? I have a question. Yeah. Um, would it make sense to, I, I don't really know that much about electric vehicles, but I'm looking into it for the future, the near future. But uh, what Robin just mentioned about the problems uh, she encountered, would it make sense to carry an extra battery that's charged up? And if the one that you have in your car, I don't know how, if you could swap them, if it's easy to swap them, um, does that make sense if you're going on a long trip to carry an extra um, and then swap it out when the one that's installed already in your car uh, runs out of charge? So Lisa, right, I would say I would say those days are behind us. <laughs> um, it could come up. Uh, I know Jim's going cross country, Wyoming, Montana. There are uh, apps. One is Better Route Planner. Uh, that's an app. There's another Plug Share in your vehicle in the Tesla. Tesla has a very good route planner, which um, also factors in uh, grade change. You know. So as those algorithms get better, it will predict, hey, normally you might get a 250 mile range here because it's cold and you're going up a mountain, you're only gonna get 145. So you can plan your charging accordingly. You do need more advanced planning, uh, Lisa, but it's not to bring along another battery and we're far enough advanced now uh, you should, if you're going on a long trip, you don't do that in a gas vehicle because, as Jim said, there's always going to be a gas station. But I would recommend, you know, using PlugShare or your vehicle app, the Chevy app, the Tesla app, 
to really plan out your charging stops and give yourself uh, a 30% buffer. You know, if you think you're gonna have 50 miles left, well, make it, well, I wanna charge when I have 100. So you don't run into a situation where you're gonna run out of electricity. Thank you. Oh, you're welcome. Back. David, did, did you uh, get your question answered? You put your hand down or did it just time out? Who? Oh. Oops, did wrong David, button. No, I had to... Yeah, I just Go was ahead. mentioning another possibility. I have a plug-in hybrid that in about 6,500 miles, I've used a little less than four tanks of gas. Uh, because almost all of my, my driving is under, under 45, 50 miles a day. And twice I've, I've, I've gone on trips uh, that it kicked into gas and used a few gallons and I got somewhere I could plug in. And I, I only use 110. I, I've only once used a uh, higher capacity, uh, uh, level two charger because it was, it was free. It was there at the conference center I was at, but mostly uses very little gas. Unfortunately, you have the maintenance of, an, of a gas engine to contend with, but it yeah. doesn't get used in all. We didn't talk about hybrids today. That could be a, a whole other uh, webinar. Yeah. Uh, go, go ahead, Dale. Yeah. Um, the idea of driverless cars, driverless taxis, and driverless delivery trucks, et cetera, et cetera. How likely is that to actually happen, do you think? It scares me to death. <laughs> So we've been flying planes on autopilot for about 50 years. So. It's a pilot there though. Yeah, but the, the road, but I would say uh, for, so in Philadelphia airports, you know, when you're doing a defined route down at the Philadelphia Navy Yard, they have an autonomous shuttle. It does the same route every day. Uh, the autonomous is safer than uh, a driver car. So I believe that's coming, it's here on a lot of routes. Uh, when you have random routes, that in my mind is you know exponentially harder, but there's a lot of defined routes where I think autonomous is already here. Somebody mentioned you know airport shuttles going from ports to a nearby parking lot. Uh, that is already here. You know, on the roadways, random traffic, um, I think yeah. that's pretty far off. Oh, good. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say that I've, I've, I've tried out the uh, the Tesla um, but it, full self-driving a little bit. And while I don't think it's a better driver than I am, I think it's a better driver than an 85-year-old parent or a 17-year-old uh, kid coming home from a party. So I, I, think, I, I think there are, you know, breaking, uh, you know, first adopters used for it. Uh, go ahead, Bob. Yeah, I had a question about, I just recently heard, and you can Google and find it about Toyota is developing uh, a solid state battery that's supposed to give uh, 745 miles of range. Does anyone, have any of you experts uh, looked at that or know anything about that you could share? Google. <laughs> I have a bias on Toyota. I'm sorry to share, but uh, the the articles that I have read, first of all, they're one of the car manufacturers slow walking electrification, and they've been sort of fighting it and sort of saying, oh, people should have all the, um, they should have all the choices they want. We're not sure they want a, that many people want electrification, and uh, they fought some of the the rules. So. Uh, they have kind of been talking about that for a while, but I will I won't say, I won't try to say that solid state won't happen. But I am a little bit more focused on what companies like the Chinese battery company CATL says, and because oftentimes what they talk about their batteries, they're ready to unveil it. You know, so um, CATL has been talking about the 600 mile range battery that they're working on, and BYD is also in addition to the cars they do a lot with batteries. So. Um, I don't have any enlightenment for you, though, as far as when we'll see the solid state batteries, but they're supposed to be more efficient. You know, the density per kilowatt of storage and things like that is supposed to be a lot better. Um, I just don't really know when we'll see it, hopefully soon. Okay. I know that one of the answers I get from them at the dealership is that they were really investing and in looking to as hydrogen as being the future. 
um, and why they were kind of dragging their feet on. That was one of the reasons I gave about, you know, on EVs. Right. Um, hydrogen, a lot of people, there's a, there's a, there's a group of people that feel it's, first of all, you got to convert the clean electricity to hydrogen, which is a cost. You have to store it. You have to transport it. It's highly volatile, explosive. Um, I, I think the, I'll just say my opinion. I don't know what the other panelists think, but my opinion is we're so far ahead with the electric vehicle and the grid that's here that can be just modified to, you know, support electric vehicles. I think it's unlikely that we're going to go to the cost that it would take to use hydrogen for electric, for, for cars and trucks, maybe long range trucks, possibly. And there's other uses of hydrogen that we don't have an answer for that maybe hydrogen will be the solution. But I don't think it's going to be a major, uh, may, use them in a major way for passenger cars or for short delivery trucks. Oh, uh, I'll add to that. Yeah, we saw, yeah, we saw a lot with the for sure, it's hydrogen. Um, we've got, uh, well, let me just, uh, one more thing. There's a question in the chat about uh, used EVs. I know, uh, you know, I think Dennis has one. I think Howard has one. I'm not sure about Rob, but you guys want to speak to the the popularity of, of used electric vehicles. Yeah, I'll start it off. The um, My last purchase was, uh, it's right outside my, window here charging uh, a 22 Kia Nero EV. Um, it's fully depreciated. When you get a new car, you know, you're paying the most in depreciation those first two years, as most of you know. Um, right now, there's a lot of uh, late models. So my 2022 was new two years ago. Uh, somebody leased it. I got the benefit of them paying the depreciation. I get the benefit of the warranty, still under warranty. Uh, I think Howard that factored in your decision, but there are all of these great used EVs now: Teslas, Bolts, uh, Ionics, uh, Nissans, and uh, it's only getting better. the The used EVs are a better bargain right now than a used uh, gasoline car. Howard, I know you just got a used Bolt. Uh, yeah, um, I think. Um used EVs are in a sweet spot now for purchase because the early adopters have uh, already purchased theirs and the mass market, the major uh, market has not quite taken off. So there are a lot of used EVs available. Um, I bought a uh, 2023 uh, Chevy Bolt EUV, which is the small SUV um, model uh, of the Bolt, and it was it was a car in excellent condition, no history of accidents, uh, no history of recalls. It was um, still under warranty. Uh, it was too recent to qualify for the rebates, but um, the price was quite low. It was uh, twenty thousand five hundred for a, a, an excellent car in excellent condition. All right, and on the used... yeah, sorry, Dennis, um, I'm just gonna wrap up. I'm gonna put up a closing slide and turn off the recorder. And then if, if folks are interested in uh, chatting for a few more minutes, we can do that. So hold tight, let me bring this up. So as I, well, first of all, thank you to our panelists. Uh, Rob, Fred, and Dennis, really appreciate your expertise in this area and, and the insight you've given us. Um, as I mentioned, this is part of a, a, a webinar series that we've done this fall, the last one, and we'll, you'll be able to find um, the recordings uh, at the original blog I have here and at the um, Sierra Club Pennsylvania chapter um, uh, YouTube channel for sure. And so thank you, everyone. I'll be sending out a follow-up email tomorrow with the links that were mentioned in today's presentation and, and links to the uh, slide decks um, and, uh, and the recording, of course. So thank you all for joining us today. Thanks, Jim.